Greetings. I uh, wanted to uh, make a video for my experimental writing course. This is uh, Ted Morrissey, and we are uh, talking about the first round of stories that we uh, read in the Bax 2020, 2020 um, book. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll share some information that's a little more specific to some of the readings, but... Um, one of the one of the discussion posts in particular got me thinking along a uh, another kind of theoretical thread. Uh, you know, last week I had talked to you about uh, Adorno and some of his uh, thoughts on experimental experimentalism, perhaps in art. And uh, the, several of you responded very favorably to that uh, foray into theory. And so when I was reminded of uh, another little theoretical thread via one of your posts, I thought I'll just go ahead and uh, go down that uh, path as well. And the, the post that um, I'm referring to, and I can't quote it uh, verbatim, but, but somebody said something to the effect that uh, uh, one of these stories that we read at least, um, they didn't think that they were creative enough to have come up with that story. And then, moreover, they were somewhat taken aback, and again, I'm paraphrasing liberally here, uh, somewhat taken aback by some of the language that was used and some of the, the scenes that were depicted in the story and so forth. And that got me to thinking about this guy, Michel Foucault. Um, and so I wanted to, to take some of his... Um, his thoughts uh, and kind of, uh, you know, think about them in the context of experimental writing and, and maybe in particular the, um, the writing, the, the reading rather, that, we, um, that we've been doing this past week or so. And, and here's why that uh, particular uh, post got me thinking about Foucault. Um, the idea of not being creative enough um, to, to come up with the particular story and also, though, at the same time, uh, not being, uh, you know, someone who normally uses the language and writes about the things that that, uh, that author was using and writing about. And um, Foucault, uh, obviously, um, you know, expansive, uh, you know, canon of material, um, you know, we associate him um, uh, primarily uh, writing, I suppose, in the in the '60s and '70s. Um, he obviously is French. Um, he had degrees in uh, psychology and philosophy. Wrote a lot about language and how language was sort of the 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 power base for for controlling people and things like that, manipulating people, and so. Um, you know, those were kind of the, the main areas, very broadly speaking, that, that Foucault uh, looked at and, and wrote about it and so on. And uh, because of uh, that, I, I've sort of developed this idea based on Foucault, um, and I can't really trace it to one specific um, thing that he said. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe, unless it's kind of gotten buried somewhere. But, but I think I've just sort of extrapolated it from reading this, that, and the other of Foucault over, over time. That um, I, I imagine thought and language as a double helix model, you know, the DNA double helix thing. And, and the two th strands of the double helix, again, are thought and language. And I think that um, for most people, they would agree that, okay, you have a thought and you turn it into language to express it to someone or, or you know, either through verbalizing it or, or writing it or what have you. But what's equally true is that the language you express is in turn affecting your thoughts. And so that's one reason why, for instance, people who are multilingual, you know, they, they have more than one language at their disposal, they will see the world in sort of more complex, nuanced kinds of ways, because having two or three or four or five languages kind of going on simultaneously in their brains, um, they 
see things and, and interpret things uh, from these various kind of language perspectives or whatever. Now, unfortunately, I am typically American monoglot, and I don't have that um, that um, you know advantage or something like that. But I know people who are multilinguistic; um, they uh, you know they will talk about that having these various sort of ways of, of looking at the world um, and and so on. So what I'm getting at here is that um, maybe it's not a matter of not being creative enough to have thought of a particular scenario, but because of not using certain kinds of language um, and expressing certain kinds of images and ideas via language, that one is sort of shutting oneself off from certain kind of creative ideas. And so if we adopt uh, the use of, of other kinds of language that we don't normally use and structure language in ways that we don't normally structure it, that will in turn open up these sort of creative pathways to, you know, other sorts of, of, of ideas that we may not have thought of, likely would not have thought of, if not for, you know, changing our language to some, to some degree, right? So anyway, that was sort of the, the, the thought process that I was kind of working on when I read that particular post. And so it got me going back to Foucault here. And so I just want to pull a few little uh, items from uh, Foucault's The Archaeology of Knowledge, which was published in 1969 originally. And, um, and then just kind of, you know, expand on those just a bit, kind of, kind of as I did with Adorno. By the way, this is uh, translated from the French by A.M. Sheridan Smith. Um, now, I don't find Foucault quite as useful and as meaningful as I do some other critics like Adorno, for example. But yet there are some things that I have, you know, latched on to over time that, that do uh, have meaning for me. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that I want to kind of highlight here and, and talk a little bit about. I've got a couple of other books here that I'm going to, you know, hopefully grab hold of here and, um, and kind of use those to expand a little bit on some of uh, Foucault's points or my points based on Foucault's points or something like that. But the very first thing that I wanted to, um, to touch on is actually from the very first chapter of uh, Unities of Discourse. And Foucault gets into a discussion of tradition. And he says, uh, take the notion of tradition. It is intended to give a special temporal status to a group of phenomena that are both successive and identical, or at least similar. It makes it possible to rethink the dispersion of history in the form of the same. It allows a reduction of the difference proper to every beginning in order to pursue without discontinuity the endless search for the origin. Tradition enables us to isolate the new against a background of permanence and to transfer its merit to originality, to genius, to the decisions proper to individuals. Right. So what I am sort of taking from that in, in the context of what we're talking about is literary tradition in the way that one structures a story. You know, again, we have been, as writers, especially if we've kind of grown up through a sort of, uh, you know, curriculum through high school and maybe undergrad and now it's in graduate school, of, of uh, teaching writing, particularly creative writing, we have been well trained in a particular way of creating narrative. Um, and, you know, I've, I've touched on this before. Uh, that, um, you know, we learn about how to structure plot, how to develop characters, how to use setting and so forth in, in pretty narrowly defined specific kind of way so that we judge whether we are successful, whether we're a good writer or not. Other And others judge us, a lot of others judge us as to whether we're good at writing or not based on how, you know, uh, easily or successfully or consistently we can fall within those pretty narrow, uh, you know, guideposts or whatever. So, so tradition in in literature sort of forces us down a particular path, and we come to accept most of us that yeah, that's right. You've got to do these sorts of things uh, when you write a story, when you write a novel, uh, and if you don't do them, 
you've you've messed up somehow or another, right? You're not doing it. You're not doing it correctly. Well, where does that tradition come from? And it comes from this guy, Aristotle. And um, Aristotle, as you you probably know, you know, the, lived in Greece. Was born around uh, 380 BCE. And his writings on poetics and rhetoric have been pretty much the, the foundation by which we have established all of our base all of our basic literary traditions. And uh, by the way, when Aristotle talks about poetics, he isn't just talking about poetry as we would think of it. He's talking about any creative work. Uh, so poetry, yes, but also what we think of as you know, fiction writing, you know, drama, uh, those kinds of things, right? So in his poetics, um, he talks about um, all the different elements that we, we think of in terms of telling a story. And Aristotle says, and by the way, this is, uh, got to get my translator here, got to get my translator credit. Um, uh, Eugene Garber. Okay, so so Aristotle says the plot then is the first principle, and as it were, the soul of a tragedy. Character holds the second place. A similar fact is seen in painting, etc., etc. Third in order is thought. That is the faculty of saying what is possible and pertinent in given circumstances. In the case of oratory, this is the function of political art and of the art of rhetoric and so forth and so on. Uh, the poets of our time, the language of the rhetoricians, character is that which reveals moral purpose, so on and so forth. And then he goes on to say, fourth among the elements enumerated comes diction, by which I mean, as has already been said, the expression of the meaning in words and its essence is the same both in verse and prose. So again, to recap, the first concern of the storyteller is plot. The second is character. The third is thought. That is to say, um, sort of the, the meaning behind the text or the meaning that the, the storyteller is trying to um, convey via the story. And then fourth is diction. In other words, the language used to tell the story. And so Aristotle laid out those four points in order first, second, third, fourth. And to this day, we still buy into that. We by and large buy into the fact that plot is the most important element. Character is second. The sort of substance, the, the meaning of the text is, is third. And then the uh, diction, the language that we use to tell the story is fourth. And as we create story after story after story, those that hierarchy is very much in our brain where we are trying to tell an interesting plot then we're then we're thinking about characterization how to develop those and last on the list how we tell the story is sort of almost a, an afterthought right the language that we use to tell the story well we go on a bit he also says uh, these principles being established, let us now discuss the proper structure of the plot, since this is the first and most important thing in tragedy. Um, tragedy is an imitation of an action that is complete and whole and of a certain magnitude, for there may be a whole that is wanting in magnitude. A whole, that's W-H-O-L-E, is that which has a beginning, a middle, and an end. A beginning is that which does not itself follow anything by causal necessity, but after which something naturally is or comes to be. An end, on the contrary, is that which itself naturally follows some other thing, either by necessity or as a rule, but has nothing following it. A middle is that which follows something as some other thing follows it. A well-constructed plot, therefore, must neither begin nor end at haphazard but conform to these principles. Let me underscore that last bit. Conform to these principles. In other words, if a story is effective, if it's good, it has to, it has to follow this particular formula of having a beginning, 
a middle, and an end, and the end has to satisfy whatever issue, you know, is kind of begun in the beginning, right? So essentially then um, we have to have a conflict, which is set out very early in, in the narrative. Um, we have to go about kind of, you know, dealing with the, the fallout of that conflict. Ultimately, that conflict has to be resolved. And that's the end of our story. And, and Aristotle, again, was was coming up with all this, you know, thousands of years ago. And it really took hold. That's exactly, in, in, the, in the Western world, that's exactly what we still believe. That, that is what makes a good, effective story is following that, you know, beginning, middle, and end principle. And so when Foucault talks about tradition, he's talking about the Aristotelian tradition when it comes to storytelling. And, and uh, we have come to believe that anything that doesn't fit within that tradition is suspect. And, of course, Foucault is talking about that as a sort of power dynamic, right? That this tradition, any tradition, but, but this tradition is sort of forced on us to, to keep certain groups in power and to keep other groups, um, you know, as powerless or, or, you know, under, underfoot, however you want to say it, right? And we can certainly see this played out in the university setting, right? Where, um, you know, we are taught these principles of how to tell a story. And if we, if we go along with it and we, we, we follow that age old formula, then we are rewarded, right? With, um, a good grade and we get to advance towards finishing our degree. Uh, and presumably then we could use that degree to ourselves, make money perhaps by perpetuating the tradition even more by becoming teachers and editors and so forth ourselves. Um, and if we don't, if we push back against tradition and we, we refuse to follow that Aristotelian paradigm, we are putting ourselves in some jeopardy, right? We may not get good grades. We may not even pass a given course. Therefore, we may not graduate and we may not be able to make money by, by perpetuating the tradition ourselves and so forth and so on. So from, from Foucault's standpoint, um, the, the tradition is, is based in, in power and control. Um, and we certainly see that um, in uh, literary journals, even though they they purport to be sort of forward thinking and, and inclusive and all those kinds of things, oftentimes I find that they are very tied to literary tradition and the things they publish tend to follow pretty consistently this Aristotelian paradigm that was established thousands of years ago. Now, non-Westerners, people who grow up in other cultures besides Europe and the United States and Canada and so forth, um, they grow up with a very different sort of narrative tradition. And so storytelling in what we think of as the Middle East or you know, in Asia and places like that um, can be very, very different um, in the way that it is structured. And um, so we oftentimes sort of reject those stories because they don't fit into this Aristotelian Western structure that we are so used to and have been convinced is the only way to write a narrative. So what's happening in a lot of the pieces that we're going to be encountering, have encountered, and are going to be encountering in this text in particular, is these are writers who have pushed back against that tradition. And, you know, some more forcefully than others. And so they are um, not accepting that that is, in fact, the only way to, to tell a story. And they are telling it in different kinds of ways. Uh, let, me, let me get back to some, some other points here. Um, so, I'm sorry, just in, kind of in the interest of time somewhat. So, so Foucault suggests 
that to push back against this power dynamic uh, that is um, that is uh, forced upon us via tradition, he says, um, what we must do, in fact, is to tear away from them their virtual self-evidence and to free the problems that they pose, to recognize that they are not the tranquil locus on the basis of which other questions concerning their structure, coherence, uh, systematicity, transformations uh, may be posed, but that they themselves pose a whole cluster of questions. What are they? How can they be defined or limited? What distinct types of laws can they obey, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we must recognize that they may not, in the last resort, be what they seem at first sight. In short, that they require a theory and that this theory cannot be constructed unless the field of the facts of discourse on the basis of which those facts are built up appears in its non-synthetic purity. All right. So, again, what I want to take from that, uh, from a sort of literary st storytelling standpoint, is that we want to, you know, knowing knowing the this uh, Aristotelian paradigm that we've all, you know, synthesized so thoroughly. We want to push back against that by looking at its various elements and not just accepting at face value that they are the best and the only way to, to make narrative, right? So some of the elements may be things that we want to embrace in a particular writing project, but some of them may not be. And so what do we want to accept and what do we want to reject in order to tell the tale that we want to tell? Because again, if we think of this way of telling a story, you know, way to construct a plot, way to use characters, way to construct meaning, way to use diction and language and so forth, if we accept that as the only way to do it, we are putting ourselves in a very, very narrow alley that we can't really, I'm going to use the metaphor, the buildings are so tall on either side of us, we can't really see anything beyond what's you know pretty much plainly in front of us. And I'm going to suggest that that really limits the stories that we tell and the subjects that we tackle. And that if we want to broaden what we're writing about um, and what we're saying, how we're communicating, we need to start to tear down those Aristotelian structures, and we need to um, only embrace the ones that are useful to us, and we need to invent new new ways of telling the story or uh, rearrange those ways or whatever. And obviously, again, bringing in Adorno, there's no new way, um, you know, strictly speaking, but there are ways that are not so, you know, locked into that Aristotelian paradigm, right? Um, and so, again, that's what experimentalists are doing. They are breaking out of that tradition in order to tell different kinds of stories. Um, and maybe, you know, the story comes first. Maybe they have something they really want to say and they know that it doesn't work in that traditional vein. Or maybe by getting out of that traditional vein, it opens up horizons on what they could potentially write about, right? So, um, so tradition is very, very powerful, and in in creative writing circles, especially in in you know, prose narrative, that tradition was established long ago by Aristotle, and we are still very much following it today, right? Um, Where you kind of touched on that a little bit. So let me let me in on a couple of, of uh, important points here. Uh, let me talk about the author. As you know, Foucault talked about the author phenomenon. You know, uh, uh, the idea of of assigning a text to a particular author and tying them to that text, and how does it how does it affect our reception of the text and our concept of the author and all that kind of business? Um, but he says, uh, 
The author is he who implants into the troublesome language of fiction its unities, its coherence, its links with reality. Okay, so, you know, barring the sexist language, hang on, I'm going to pause this. Sorry, had a sneeze coming on. Didn't want you to experience that. So barring the sexist language that Foucault was using back in the 60s, um, the author is he who implants into the troublesome language of fiction its unities, its coherence, its links with reality. And so um, what I'm going to take from that to suggest is that the author is the authority, right? And that's obviously where the word comes from. Um, if you are known as an authority on a subject, generally what that means is you have published on that subject, right? And, um, and so I'm going to suggest that as an author, you have the power to take from the Aristotelian paradigm what you want to take and to leave what you want to leave. And if you put forward some other kind of narrative that is using the elements of storytelling differently than that traditional way, that's okay. You as author are giving authority to that type of text. But before you can get to that point, you have to accept your, uh, your role as author. And that if you are still thinking that a, a successful or an effective storyteller is only a storyteller who uses those narrative elements the way Aristotle told us to use them thousands of years ago, you are sort of depleting your own authority. You need to put forward your own, your own sense. And that brings me to this guy my idol, William H. Gass. Um, Gass, uh, uh, not to go too far afield here, uh, but to try to stay sort of tethered to just these specific elements I've been talking about, Gass did not accept the Aristotelian paradigm of plot, character, meaning, language. In fact, he turned that on its ear Gas was mainly interested in language and how to use language and plot and characterization were way down on the list, which is why he's something of an acquired taste. You know, we have been so conditioned to look for this really engaging plot, you know, right off the bat, that if we don't get that, we tend to be dismissive of it and we maybe don't ever get through, um, you know, the text to, to find out what else is there. But, but Gass says, um, and this is the quote they use on the back of uh, Conversations with uh, William H. Gass, a book I highly recommend you getting a hold of, a compendium of, of interviews with Gass. But uh, the quote they use, because this is really kind of the, the kernel of it all, is when Gass says, as a writer, I have only one responsibility. And that's the language I'm using into the thing I'm trying to make. So for Gass, his fiction writing was an effort to make literary art, not to write a not to write a, a pot boiler, not to write a you know New York Times bestseller, but to use language as artfully and as you know uh, engagingly as possible, right? And to that end. Um, I wanted to, to go to this. This is an early interview there in chronological sequence. This is 1971. So this is actually pretty, you know, close to the time that Foucault was writing The Archaeology of Knowledge, published in 69 again. But in a, uh, an interview with um, sorry, Carol Spear and Macaulay, 1971, uh, she asked, Point blank. Do you have any advice for beginning writers? Do you recommend fiction writing classes? Would you ever teach creative writing? If so, what would be your approach? And this is what Gas said. My advice for beginning writers is to fir is first to recognize that writers differ a great deal in their own natures and in the nature of their talent. 
and that little advice, which is general, can be of much value. Learn not to take advice. Look to yourself. Make yourself worthy of trust. No art can be taught, though some techniques sometimes can. Writing classes help some, don't others. It depends, again, on the kind of person you are. Do whatever works. It wouldn't have worked for me, and I am personally suspicious of them. I've, caught, I've taught creative writing a little, but I would never make a habit of it. All right, and he goes on a bit from there. But learn not to take advice. Look to yourself. Make yourself worthy of trust. And so, again, I want to hook that back up with uh, Foucault's thought on the author. Um, the author is he or she or they who implants into the troublesome language of fiction its unity, its coherence, its links with reality. You have the power. You are the writer, and, and you are telling your story the way you want to tell it. So you include in it what you want to include. If some of those Aristotelian ideas work for the story, great. If not, don't, don't bother using them. You know, figure out some other way of doing it um, and trust yourself, trust your judgment in that, in that process. All right. Now, um, again, we're talking about a, a sort of fiction here, which is not terribly popular, right? Um, if your ambition is to be a New York Times bestselling author, to support yourself via your writing, to have book clubs, you know, read your book and talk about your book and, you know, and go on, you know, author tours and events and book signings, and all that kind of thing. Um, you probably are not going to want to write, you know, experimental fiction, right? That's a different kind of writing. I'm not downplaying that. I'm not uh, demeaning that. That is a particular skill set. Um, and some writers want that and they, um, they get very good at, at, at creating books and stories and so forth using that skill set. It's very Aristotelian based, you know, so, you know, you can, if, you, if you're really good at that and comfortable with that, that's great. But what we're talking about in this course is, is a different kind of writing. Now, you can achieve a certain sort of popularity, um, but not New York Times bestseller popularity, right? This is about creating literary art um, and having the satisfaction of creating something that you really enjoyed creating and you're proud of, and maybe hopefully a few other people will appreciate what you have created, but probably thousands and thousands of people are not going to appreciate it, right? It's a more, you know, select kind of group. But Nevertheless, this is the last Foucault point I want to uh, I want to end with here. He writes, for a discipline to exist, there must be the possibility of formulating and of doing so ad infinitum fresh propositions. So in order for that more traditional sort of literature to exist and to be popular, there must be also, as part of the discipline, this more experimental, non-traditional, non-orthodox, unorthodox um, sort of writing going on as well. They are all part of the whole, and H, you know, W-H-O-L-E, right? They're all part of the whole, and therefore all equally important. So even though experimental writing isn't read as much uh, by any stretch of the imagination as more traditional writing, even though it, it doesn't you know, warrant the same sort of financial rewards and so forth, it is still an important part of the, the literature that's being produced. And in fact, it makes possible the, the traditional. So in other words, there would be no traditional if the non-traditional didn't also exist. So I think you know, as writers, particularly if we are writers who gravitate towards the experimental to the non-traditional, the unorthodox, we can take great pride in the fact that we are contributing to 
the literature as a whole and the traditional would be devalued if we weren't creating the non-traditional, the experimental, the unorthodox, the unusual, whatever word you want to use, right? Um, so yeah, so so we um, so we in this in this course are looking at uh, experimental writing, and as I've said, we've started off with fairly traditional. This next set of, uh, of things we're going to look at is pushing the boundaries more so. And then the following week, uh, we're going to be looking at really uh, unorthodox, you know, non-traditional experimental uh, pieces uh, that, um, you know, the writers really, really kind of throw all of the Aristotelian stuff uh, out, the, out the window and um, are just really you know, going out on, on a limb. Now, um, I know that not everyone wants to be an experimental writer, and, and, and that's probably just as well. But I do think that even a traditional writer and someone who wants to be a traditional writer, um, they can really expand their creativity and their effectiveness as a writer by, by looking at writing in some of the same kinds of ways that these experimentalists do. And so um, even if it's just expanding your vocabulary in a particular direction, allowing yourself to write about certain kinds of subjects, um, you know, changing the form somehow or another, the structure somehow or another, again, maybe not, you know, a lot, but a little, that those can really, uh, you know, feed uh, our creativity and we can uh, produce, you know, even more interesting and dynamic traditional fiction than if we hadn't gone down that path at all. All right. So I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about any or all of that. Um, and I will stop there and see you down the digital trail.